After three days of the New South Wales PGA Golf Championship, Sydney's Jeff Wagner takes a big lead into tomorrow's final round for the second time in the tournament. Wagner has fired a 4-under 66 to be at 9-under. His opponents couldn't take advantage of the drier conditions after two days of heavy rain at the Cromer course, and Wagner leads the field by six shots. Anthony Painter and Wayne Dodd have dropped out of contention, really, with poor rounds today. The trio of Russell Swanson, Martin Peterson and Lucas Parsons are locked together at 3-under to be equal second. Here's the leaderboard, shows Jeffrey Wagner with that 9-under. That includes two course record 66s on minus three, Swanson, Parsons and Peterson, and Dodd is a stroke away. So I guess not out of it yet, but Jeffrey Wagner looks like he might have that sewn up. The New York Knicks came from behind to score a 90 points to 83 win against the Atlanta Hawks, moving within one game of the Hawks in the NBA's Eastern Conference. In today's other games, Detroit down the Nets, Miami beat Denver, Orlando by 16 against Philly, Phoenix trounced the Bullets with Sacramento, Indiana and Portland all victorious as well. And Australian basketballer Luke Longley has been in the NBA for three years, which is a landmark achievement in itself. But he's been traded from the lowly Minnesota Timberwolves to the champions for three years, the Chicago Bulls. We've taken an inside look at Longley in the big time. This is the best there is, no doubt about it. That's what happens when you're world champions. For the last two of his three seasons at Minnesota, Luke Longley had been just a run-of-the-mill centre, fighting for a regular spot in the second-worst team. Now, he walks with gods. He can use the weights Michael Jordan used and the indoor running track. He can even play in the starting five. There's a lot of centers on this team and to get, to get a start like that quickly was, was good. Uh, first half was a little shaky, but, but uh, good numbers in the end. Even without Jordan, the Bulls have been as good as ever until the last couple of weeks. And that's where Longley comes in. He's hit the ground running. Hopefully he's going to have a real good run with us this year. 16 points and 10 rebounds in his first game. And the big efforts continue. It's seeing what this team does after the play breaks down. It's hard. A couple of days today, times today I got in people's way on back cuts where, you know, that's the way our team would have played it. My old team, I beg your pardon, but this team plays it differently. So it's a learning process. The other thing about playing for Chicago, the prestige. It's one thing bouncing and bumping with the world's best for three years. It's another sharing their locker room. We feel real good about Luke being in Chicago and you know, his, the prospects for him being here a long time and, and what he can mean to this team down, down the road are, uh, are real positives. Well, yeah, I think he's doing great. Uh, we've had a lot of slippage since the All-Star break, but uh, you know, we've a good group of guys. We enjoy playing with each other. The team's been very good, very, you know, uh, easy going, easy to get along with. I haven't found, obviously, haven't found a place to live yet, but that'll, that'll come in due time. The first Aussie to play in the NBA has landed in the big time. Now he has to stay. Yeah, up to him. Litre sprint cars. They don't sound much, do they? Still, they do a lap of the Newcastle Motordrome in 15 seconds at 100 k's an hour. And even our own Flash Harry Potter finds it pretty hard to keep up. The crack New South Wales drivers have gathered for the series of dashes around Newcastle Motodrome in the sliding flying fun machines they call the Lita Sprints. There's big money on offer Saturday night and vital sponsorship dollars to secure. The best throttle crashes from interstate are among the 40 starters eager to lift the title. Enter 33-year-old sprint car veteran Cherise Schaefer and Robin Phillips, 28, both from Queensland. They wear makeup and earrings through the dust and grime of the pits, but give no ground when push turns to show a dangerous high speed on the track. Oh, I've certainly had a few bad spills, but I think the day you start thinking twice about going back, there's a day we've got to throw the tail in. You know it's coming. <laughs> You're kind of talking to the car and, and telling it to yeah, you know, land softly in that. They'll get no favours from this state's hard-running Mel Guy, who's still hurting after a breakdown when within reach of the title last year. He knows the two women will have to lap the quarter-mile track repeatedly in just over 14 seconds, averaging 100 kilometres an hour. Sharia's capable of doing just that. At the end of the straight, where you've got to turn left without lifting your foot, that's fast. You'd have to love it because you're not in it for the money. Sydney's Jason Begg also knows the pressure that builds through the last laps of a state title. You're pretty nervous. You, you don't want to make a mistake in the last lap. So you try and 
you want to take it easy, but then you've got to keep going because there's cars behind, you don't know where they are, so it's pretty, pretty frightening, yeah. OK, so I'm new at this game, but it might surprise you to know that a few weeks ago here at the Motodrome, I managed to finish 10th out of 22 cars in a feature race and win the princely sum of $20 in prize money. So let's see just how good these girls are. Both hands have the tactics involved in a rolling start. Sharia Robin let me power away in car eight for several laps. Then just like a woman, beat me to the flag. He's been talking about it ever since. He just loved it. It looks like fun, I have to say. Still to come in sports tonight from the crawl of Parramatta Road, or Turak Road for that matter, to Eastern Creek. And no speed restrictions. Amanda to pledge goes trucking at 160 kilometres an hour, come hell or high water. <laughs> There is an official silence from authorities over Australian cricketer Merv Hughes' bat-wielding incident in the first test against South Africa in Johannesburg. The Australian Cricket Board is still to make a statement on Hughes' confrontation with a spectator. The board is waiting to receive a report from team management before commenting or taking any further action. The Aussies have now moved on to Sun City, well away from the controversies of the test in Johannesburg. Of course, we're allowed to ask, what about the kids? Concerns about our children imitating the aggressive behaviour are very real. Anthony Hudson reports. It's the third day. Ah! And he's bowling behind his pants. Ball has done it. I like how he screams. I think it's very good sportsmanship. Uh, well, I don't really like the umpires either, so I can't say on that. That little swinger getting through the defences there of Kirsten. Decided to come long before the tie to eye stuff. 19 for no looking. Yes! Yes! There's no doubt Merv Hughes and in particular Shane Warne who've done a lot for cricket in Australia. The sport is booming in the schools and it seems everyone wants to bowl leg spin. See that Kellis? Yep. That's what you get. Yep. Right around the ball. Maybe some of them will uh, will dye their hair. Who knows? But uh, they're just coming in and bowling spinners and and keen to be another Shane Warne, which is great. But when Warne and Hughes' aggressive style goes too far, should authorities and parents be concerned about how children following suit? But the conduct of Shane Warne and Merv Hughes in Johannesburg on Sunday was unacceptable detrimental to the interests of Australian cricket and provided a totally inappropriate role model for young Australians to follow. It is a little bit of a worry. I mean, uh, the kids are influenced by them, can be influenced by them, and uh, so we just have to watch. But according to psychologist John Cheatham, the children won't follow all the behaviour of their heroes. Unless they're intellectually retarded, no. Children will occasionally try to imitate behaviour, but it's up to parents and coaches to take control and show them that it's not appropriate. They shouldn't, like, scream and stuff. They should just, like, um, go with the walls. Now, I've just heard that through on the wires from South Africa, Shane Warne has apologised profusely to Andrew Hudson and the umpires. Now, the criticism of him, mine included, I believe was justified, but his response now has been sporting and courageous. Good on him. He's too good for it all. And uh, we should leave it at that. Rugby League and Canterbury Bankstown's Terry Lamb preparing for his 15th season of Winfield Cup Rugby League. He's got a bung leg, he can't train with his teammates and fast losing the ability to be agile in defence. But you know, of course, that Terry Lamb will shrug it all off to be the Bulldogs' best player. As a rookie with West back in 1980, Terry Lamb first hit the big time. A move to Belmore and 15 seasons later, he's looking forward to yet another season. I remember my first game with West and I remember my first year at Canterbury, but uh, in between it's, it's a little bit blurry. It's hard to believe anyone would put their body through 15 seasons of Winfield Cup football. Then again, it's hard to think of Canterbury without Terry Lamb. His body is showing the scars of endurance, still unable to complete a full training session with his teammates thanks to a never-ending list of injuries. Lamb is still the one that gives the Bulldogs direction. You know, I'm doing the ball work with the players, and uh, even though I'm not out there with the physical side of it, uh, the match fitness gets me through. As soon as you start getting match fitness, you can go right through the season. At 33, he's treating this season as his last for the moment. Whether he puts himself, his body and his family through a 16th... <laughs> I'll tell you September. Canterbury's first match is against Manly at Brookvale on Sunday. One of the best of the modern era.
After the most intensive off-season build-up in Waratah history, New South Wales Rugby has finally announced the squad to tour New Zealand. The surprise inclusion is a Fijian forward who hasn't played here. In the backs, former Queenslander Mark Catchpole has displaced Wallaby half Anthony Eckert. The new faces include Paul Horton, Mitch Hardy, Jason Matz and Phil Scar. In the engine room, Michael Bryle and Tony Daly will lead a new look forward pack with the newest member, Fiji's Sam Damoni. Meet Big Sam Damoni, 200 centimetres tall and weighing 115 kilos with a typical Fijian grin. And why wouldn't he be smiling? Selected in the Waratahs, fresh off the plane without playing a game. It's been a shock to me and um, I hope things go great from here. At the moment I'm still getting through the, the old jet lag thing from, from England. Oblivious to the drama his selection has caused in the Sydney rugby circles, Big Sam wants a wallaby jumper as well, just like fellow countryman Illy Tambua. Well, if Illy can make it, why can't I? Based in London for the last two years, Damoni won a flanker's spot on experience and height, the vital ingredients for a middle-of-the-line-out jumper. I have been playing in that position for the past about five years, and I, I specialise in that position, number four jumper. The other major surprise, the good form of half-back Mark Catchpole has forced the selectors to omit wallaby half Anthony Eckert. The Waratahs leave for New Zealand tomorrow week for three lead-up games before their first Super 10 match against Waikato on April the 2nd. And coming up, the New South Wales PGA, Luke Longley, raging in American basketball, and our Flash Harry Potter puts his foot down. Don't worry, Katie, it's in a sprint car. Well, an indication of how tight and competitive truck racing has become, last year's Australian Championship is still to be decided. Not on the track, but in the court. And they're already revving up for this year's event. Amanda to pledge, after a slow start, got trucking with the best of them. Where would you rather be right at this moment? Oh, flying down the freeway, doing a tonne. <laughs> What would you rather be doing now than being caught in this peak hour traffic? Oh, out on the highway, doing about uh, 60 miles an hour. Oh, I hate the traffic around here, it's terrible. So what happens when you let a few truckies loose at Oran Park? On the road, we've got to stick to the speed limited uh, government, so we've got to do the right thing out there. So when weekends come and you can come out here and um, try to rip your mask off and go for it, it's really good. All week, Rodney Creek pulls coal from the mines at Oakdale in New South Wales to the refinery at Port Kembla. It's a long, hard slog. So this weekend, Rodney's off to the races, and he's taking his truck too. Problem is, there'll be 20 truckies 20 trucks on a track built for one. Pretty wild on tight circuit like this. Um, a lot of fireworks, a lot of um, rubbing paint and sideways type of driving. 1990 champion Albert Cedars is one of our trucking pioneers. When we, we first um, got into truck racing, it was just more or less a go, go and get a truck off the street and you um, put a roll cage in it, set a decent tyres and uh, you know, a few modifications and off we went. Six years and $150,000 later, a marvel of modern day mechanics. This is a truckie's dream machine. More than a thousand horsepower under the bonnet, fuel injected and turbocharged. It's features like this that put these racing rigs way ahead of their working relations. And as for their city cousins caught in the grind, I just feel sorry for them poor buggers sitting in the traffic and we're out here um, flying around 160 kilometres an hour. Get rid of your truck and come out here and go truck racing. Yeah, why not? Tomorrow, real horsepower when the pres we present the 1994 Nissan Inter-Dominion final from start to finish. March the 10th. That is Sports Tonight. I'm Tim Webster. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.